Hey guys, what is up? Super K-Man Rocks here, and we are here for day number seven of the 2024 World Championships Swiss Stage, and I am very excited for day seven. Of course, by the end of today's episode, we are going to know our three teams to come out of the 2-1 bracket into quarterfinals, and the three teams that are going to need to fight their way back in from the 2-2 two and two spot. We will also be starting our 1-2 and two matchups, and we're going to see our first team eliminate for round number four of the tournament. So I'm very excited. I hope you guys are excited. Of course, if you want to know my thoughts on the previous six days as well as the play-ins, you can check out the playlist up in the iCard. Specifically, I'm going to have day number six up there, yesterday's video, because that's pretty relevant to how a lot of the games today went. We could be seeing uh, a couple of the teams from yesterday and today face off, depending on how things go. So I'm very excited to get into it. I hope you guys are as well. Check that out if you are interested, but I don't want to waste you guys' time too much at the beginning of the video. Let's Let's get into it. If you are new here, what we are going to do is go game by game in both of the series today, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I'll be giving a player of the game and a dud of the game for each individual game that we cover, and of course, at the end of both series, I will be giving a player of the series to tie everything into a nice, neat little bow. We will be talking about tomorrow's games as well, but I've previewed everything at the end of last week's games, day number five, so check that out if you want a real in-depth analysis, but definitely will be talking about the final two best of threes that we are going to get in this kind of round four stage before we jump into the 2-2 matchups and then eventually the quarterfinals. So we're getting real close to ending off Swiss. This is the final weekend. So definitely very excited to get into it. But without further ado, don't want to waste you guys' time too much as I always try to say and then end up waste you guys, wasting you guys' time. Let's get right into it. Let's get into the first series of the day. And to me, as I've said multiple times, I expect this to be the closest series of the round four of the 2-1, 1-2 stage here. I think both of these teams are are very even in terms of the form that they've been in and just the overall talent on the team. It's the number one seed from the LEC in G2 Esports taking on the number four seed from the LCK in T1. This is a pretty historic rivalry in LOL Esports. These two teams have faced off a ton. T1 for the most part getting the better of this matchup, but not by like a lot, like a lot less than you would think. Obviously, G2's run of dominance around 2019 kind of came through T1. They were kind of the opponent that they kept toppling to get to their major ambitions, whether it was winning MSI in 2019 or making World Finals. In 2019, they had to beat T1 both times in order to get there, and so this team is not unfamiliar, or at least, you know, someone like Caps and Mickey X, like they're not unfamiliar with being able to take down the T1 Giants, and you know, that's a good thing. They've been able to dominate the LEC all year, and they've looked really good at this tournament. However, T1 have definitely leveled up from what they have been domestically, and we kind of all expected that. It's kind of what they do every single year, even when they play well domestically. That's when they win worlds internationally, and so... You feel good about both of these teams coming into it, but only one's going to be able to come out going to the quarterfinals. I think it's funny how their stories are so similar because I think both of them had, you know, rough summer splits. So we'll just say that, or at least rough ends to the summer split. You had T1 who barely qualified through the regional finals, had to go to a game five against KT Rolster to even be here at all. And you had G2 who obviously dominated the entirety of the LEC year only to lose a best of five to Mad Lions and have to fight their way back through the season finals, really facing adversity domestically for the first time in 2024. Both of them not necessarily looking their best selves coming into this tournament, but both of them reassuring a lot of their fan base over the course of their first, you know, three games that they are exactly who we thought they were going to be. So who's going to be able to live up to that? It's going to be interesting. I think obviously a lot of people are going to look at Caps versus Faker, but to me, by far the most important matchup is going to be Yike versus Owner. I think whichever one of them is going to be able to generate consistent early game leads is probably going to win this series. Not because, you know, these teams are super early game focused, 
focused, but because G2 is so late game focused, if they can survive and get to the later half of the game, especially with the gold lead, if Yike can actually do something in the early and in the mid game, that's going to be a problem for T1 because I just think G2 is better in that stage. But the reason that I predicted T1 in my previous video when I talked about who I thought was going to come out of this series is because I think their early games are just going to be more consistent. I think that they have a better read on the meta. I think tradition or generally right now, um, Western teams just have a really poor read on the meta. I do not think they understand the strong champions particularly well. I think that has been proven over the course of this tournament, basically outside of like FlyQuest, who just wants to draft all their own shit. Everybody's drafting for a meta that doesn't exist right now. And T1, I think, is very much opting into much more standard stuff. They've been much more willing to play the things that are actually strong at this tournament, which is a good thing. And that's why I think their early games are going to be a bit more consistent. But again, if G2 can just stall games out, they're probably the more consistent team in terms of macro and in terms of team fighting. I just, I don't know if they have the hands to go 1v1 in some of these lanes. Things like jungle obviously are going to be a bit of a problem. I think bot lane could theoretically be a problem for uh, G2. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what, you know, uh, ends up coming of this matchup. Obviously the winner ends up going to the quarterfinals. The loser still is in the tournament. They're not eliminated or anything, but they're on life point at that point. They're, they're going to the two and two matchup and that's going to be one final series. So both of these teams want to get out in this series. Who's going to be able to take it? Well, of course, to figure that out, we got to go game by game. And that means starting with game number one. So let's get into it. The winner of game number one was... T1. They are going to take game number one. They're going to go up in this series, one to nothing. This is your standard T1 game where they're able to get a pretty decent lead in the early and in the mid game, and then eventually around 15 to 20 minutes, it just blows wide open with them making good play after good play. We actually haven't seen this kind of win from T1 a lot over the course of this year, but when you're talking about 2022, 2023, this is the way that they were winning games. This is very traditional for what this team looks like when they are playing at their best. For G2, I think they had a game plan. They really wanted to make sure this Draven was in a good spot, and they invested a lot of resources into making sure that Hansama was getting skirmishes early, but unfortunately, he kind of just got outplayed, and quite frankly, a lot of G2 just got outplayed throughout the mid and late game here in terms of these fights. They eventually got so far behind that it didn't really matter that their comp was starting to get online, and that this Wombo combo with Nocturne Orianna could actually start, you know, doing some things, because it was never a one-for-one. One. At that point, you could, it's really hard to trade when you've got a Gragas that's full damage and playing incredibly well on the other side, when you've got you know, Faker who's popping off and is starting to pick up kills and is super far ahead in terms of itemization, you know, a gin that's ahead. It's just really difficult to end up trading in those scenarios, and so T1 just ends up taking it, and this was our fear. Our fear for this series was that T1 is likely just going to be way better in the early and in the mid game, and G2 is going to be better in the late game, but if they can't get there all that easily, then it doesn't matter, and that's exactly what we saw here in game one. Player of the game kind of has to go to Zeus. I mean, this was an unbelievably good performance from him on Gragas. The broadcast, you know, rightfully talked up how good his Gragas has been over the course of his career. He's got like an 85% win right now on the champion, and that shows in tape. I've talked about this for years on the channel that Gragas is his best champion in terms of performance, and just in terms of what we see generally, it is a very good counter to Jax, and honestly, this is a great pick from T1. I think I'm a little bit worried about their draft in terms of, you know, long-term prospects if they don't get that early lead, but that's what they're banking on in this series against G2, so I understand the idea behind it. I don't think a lot of teams could pull off the draft that T1 drafted here. I don't think they generally won draft or anything like that, but the Gragas ended up being a pretty massive problem for G2 because not only was it going to just you know, shut off the jacks and make it a lot more difficult for him to lane and get to that phase where he's strong, but also Zeus is so aggressive as a playmaker, and if he's going to build damage, he's going to do a ton of that throughout this game. I think Owner and Faker were also really on point in this one. Faker missed a couple of charms in the early game, but by the time we hit like the 15, 16 minute mark, he was landing them left and right, really playing well. That's what you want to see from Faker. He has been concerning, not only at this tournament, but throughout all of this year. In terms of his raw mechanics, I think his decision-making has definitely been more questionable over the course of the entire year, but this was a very solid game, and Owner was setting all of that up. Sometimes that can be a little bit low on Skarner, but generally when you're going into something like Nocturne, a lot of the flaws of Skarner don't get exposed nearly as much because there is, Nocturne can't kill him, right? Nocturne actually can't fight him really at any point throughout the entire game, so... Credit to Owner, I thought he played well. He's actually been amazing at this tournament, and Faker, I thought, had one of his better games in a while. Guma and Karia were also 
fine. All things considered, Guma was good in the late game, but early game there, 2v2 wasn't ideal. I mean, it's Draven Nautilus, you kind of have to accept that, but overall, this was a pretty T1, T1 game, and they're going to feel good to walk out with the 1-0 win. And then for G2 on the other side, again, just a very clear game plan that they just weren't able to get ahead on. This is kind of the concern for G2, is that their early games have not been very good, especially over the past two months, where they've really struggled to be able to generate leads, even domestically. I mean, famously in the finals, the summer finals against Fnatic, they went down pretty heavily in all three games games ended up coming back in all three games and it's just like okay whatever man like it, it, you know it is what it is it doesn't matter if G2 loses in the early game but we're seeing those problems where it doesn't feel like they have a good grasp of the things they want to trade for on the map they were really invested into trying to get the grubs this game and they did they got five of the grubs which on paper sounds great until you realize grubs have like a 48% win rate or having more grubs at this tournament is like a 48% win rate you are just as likely to lose as you are to win when you get more grubs than the enemy team it's a crazy Crazy stat, but it's kind of held true throughout a majority of this year in some of the major regions. It's very strange how it doesn't really correlate to success. And the big problem for G2 is T1's dragon stacking, which by the time they hit, you know, the fourth, the sole point, they can no longer fight over it because T1 has gotten so strong and they have such great area control with things like Skarner, things like Jin, things like Ari, and even Gragas that it's really difficult to end up engaging on them. So you have this comp that's really designed to dive onto the backline with Nocturne Oriana, get that big wombo combo off onto these backliners without any real way to get in outside of Nocturne Ultimate. Jax has a really hard time playing this out, and while you can theoretically get a front-to-back with Orianna and Draven on the back line, your front line melts like butter. I mean, Mickey X is going to die instantly. He's going to get dud of the game, not even entirely up to him. I mean, obviously getting caught at level 1 is not ideal, but outside of that, he was just paper this game. He uh, Playing Nautilus, he just died over and over and over again. It felt like he couldn't survive any sort of engage, and that was a big problem for G2 because it meant that the Nautilus was essentially a hook like he he hooked he auto attacked and then he died like that was his entire kit throughout the entire game because he didn't live long enough to do anything else he just kind of melted and that's the big problem is you set up this comp where once the nocturne oriana is done you have to hope and pray that the draven has enough damage to break through everything else and you just don't have that time and so overall for g2 i don't hate the idea of the comp but if you play it you have to win like you have to get a gold lead in the mid game you can't be losing these skirmishes around you know rift herald or things like that like that's a disaster for this comp and then eventually the game just spirals out of control. You're down 6,000 gold and there's no real way to come back. And so I do think this is winnable for G2, but game number one definitely showed that T1 has a slightly better understanding of how to play out the mid game. I would say right now in this meta, they can keep that up. They're going to be moving to the quarterfinals, but G2, we know they have the talent to be able to take game number two. So is G2 going to be able to stay alive here in game number two, or is T1 going to be able to punch their ticket to those quarterfinals that they desperately want to reach? Well, the winner of game number two was T1. They are going to take game number two. They're going to take this series two to nothing, and they will punch their ticket to the quarterfinals. I feel bad for G2. This is obviously a very frustrating way to lose a game. This was such a back and forth affair. It looked like G2 was going to outscale T1. It looked like a lot of the things that we had talked about in the preview that a lot of the analysts have been talking about, basically everybody where G2's just so good in the late game despite their early struggles. It looked like all of that was going to come to fruition with G2 having this really nice comeback at multiple points, having two, three inhibitors down, fighting in the base to try to end the game, but they just can't get it done. It's just a couple of small slip-ups and generally just some fantastic play from T1 that ends up pushing them over the top. They end up getting Elder and being able to end off of that. Like, again, I, I would be so frustrated if I was G2, not only because I lost this, but because it is so familiar to how they lost earlier in the tournament to Hanwha Life Esports that you know, you just have to start saying, well, we, we got to close out these games. We got to be able to finish these things off against these top LCK teams because we are being given opportunities and they're just not coming to fruition. There are a couple of things that I think definitely help T1, but they have the worst team fighting comp and yet they still were able to come out on top because they were constantly finding angles. Player of the game, flip a coin. I mean, it's owner or faker, but you do not win this game without both of them playing perfect. It is impossible to win this without both of them being about as... 100% as you can get it. Like, genuinely, do you want to give it to Owner? Because he was the one initiating and getting on priority targets, finding flank angles, including this blast cone over the wall to immediately get onto caps in the final, like, Elder Dragon fight. 
Yes, go ahead. Owner was phenomenal, and he's been T1's best player at this tournament. Do you want to give it to Faker? Because he was the one that was following up on a lot of that and even did a lot of playmaking on his own, finding these flank angles himself to find these charms and to find damage and to just line up these cues. And we haven't seen an Ari carry at this entire tournament be successful, and yet here Faker is dominating the back half of this game. Like, yeah, Faker's going to get my player of the game. But again, like, it's both of them. You can't win this game without both of them being perfect. They are both the player of the game. I want to make that as abundantly clear as I can say it. Everybody else in this team was fine. We'll talk about it. I think specifically Caria had a really good game, but Owner and Faker were the dominating ones, and Faker's going to get both my player of the game and my player of the series as a whole. This is the second time this year that internationally Faker has been able to take it to Caps, and it's certainly starting to become a little bit of a trend. Not that Caps was miserable in this game or anything. It's just he was out of position a couple of times. He was a little too far forward. Not all of it was his fault. Some of it was just the macro decisions from G2 being too far forward collectively as a team, but Faker was absolutely there to punish it. Owner was absolutely there to punish it, and they really pushed T1 over the top. And one thing that I don't think is going to get talked about enough is just how consequential we have seen these objective trades be in terms of who wins these games. I've talked, I've talked about it a lot on this channel. I've talked about how grubs are very overrated because like clearly they are. Look at their win rate across every major region and here at Worlds. It's not nearly as good as you would want it to be. G2 gets all six grubs in this game, but I want to make it clear why I say that. It's not just me reading a stat and going grubs must be bad because it's neutral. They must not be consequential. Grubs are very consequential. The problem is that oftentimes the reason that grubs have such a low win rate in comparison to other objectives is because you're trading it for dragons in a lot of cases, and dragons are just better. Like, they're just more valuable. We have seen it throughout the entirety of this tournament. T1 Mountain Soul, this game was so ginormous for this team. I think that's probably the most underrated part of this game. The moment T1 gets Mountain Soul, G2's team is like really, really difficult to execute because they don't have the damage to actually break through the Vi and the Jax and the Leona nearly as quickly as they need to in order to stop a lot of these picks from happening. It opens up more time for the Ari to dash around and for Jin to just fire off in the back line. It just gives T1 everything that this comp could possibly want in the back half of this game and Again, it just gives them more chances. It gives them more opportunities to scale out the rest of this game, to survive some of the poke that's happening as they're pushing into the base. It's just, it's such a good thing to get, and dragons continue to be something that, if I'm a team, like, there's no way that I'm giving over soul point. Like, at any point, you have to fight for it in the meta right now. It just seems to be way too strong. We see it game after game that dragons continuously dictate the tempo of the late game, and if you're going to have them versus a team that doesn't have them, like, yeah, you have such a gigantic advantage right now even the bad ones. So overall for T1, Dragon stacking very much proving to be a success across this series. Um, but yeah, Faker owner, excellent. Zeus was great in game one, was still okay here in game number two on the Jacks. a couple of great follow-ups, but for the most part, what he was really good at was stalling the game out in the base, was catching waves and not getting poked out as the Jacks, which is really big. Um, Caria, like I said, was phenomenal here on the Leona. Multiple fantastic ultimates coming in from him, including three or four man ults at times because G2 was just so clumped up, just the way their comp ends up working. So credit to Caria. I think Guma also played relatively well, obviously relatively low damage, but you just kind of have to live with that. Faker was the carry on this team. Owner was the carry on this team, and both of them ended up following through, and T1 is going to be going to the quarterfinals because of it, despite how their year has gone up until this point. And then for G2 on the other side of this, again, they're going to feel relatively heartbroken with how things end up going down. The game state, the gold graph has got to be really frustrating to look at where it's just T1 dominating the early game. G2 fights back incredibly. They take all three inhibitors. They're on the Nexus, and they just can't close it out. They get Baron stolen, and then eventually they lose one fight, and they lose two fights. They lose Elder. They lose a third fight, and the game is over. It's got to feel heartbreaking, but they're not eliminated just yet. There are some things to talk about. This team obviously puts a ton of priority into Nocturne Oriana. We kind of expected something like this coming into the tournament. G2 has always been one of those teams that's preferred, like, one style that finds what they really like before a tournament and really sticks to that. This is clearly what they have found in scrims and in practice that they've really enjoyed and really feel comfortable on, especially against these top teams, and it can really work. We've seen it be super successful over the course of this tournament. The problem is that Sometimes you can get really squishy in situations like this. I think generally they have the better comp in this game, which makes it even more frustrating that they end up losing it. But dead of the game for me is going to go to Han Sama in the bot lane. He just got caught out way too much. He even bought Zonia's in the back half of this game. It just didn't matter. It felt like every single time that he had the ability to die, he ended up dying. Now, how much of that is owner and faker just constantly being in better positions and basically perfect positions as opposed to G2? I don't know, but Hans was definitely not nearly as relevant as he needed to be in the back half of this game as the Kai'Sa 
as the hyper carry. Yike was kind of the damage carry in this game for G2, and that's just unacceptable. Like, you can't get away with that. Nocturne cannot be your number one option. I think Broken Blade was generally fine, but he also took a ton of bad trades in the mid game that actually ended up giving over a lot of pressure to T1. Um, not consequential, like majorly consequential stuff, I guess I should say, but it, it was definitely something I noticed. Mickey, I thought, was generally fine this game. Still not very good in the early game, but that's kind of a Nautilus thing, and Mickey will get caught out. Mickey, uh, every every so often, he will make the worst play you've ever seen in your life, and you just kind of have to live with it. Um, you know, it just, it is what it is. Um, but Caps, again, not nearly as consequential as Faker on the other side of this. Caps is the guy for G2. When he gets outplayed, this team has a hard time winning games regardless of how well everybody else plays. So for G2, again, there's still so much good. It's basically everything we said about the Hanwha Life game just extrapolated across two, where it felt like they were so close against such a good team. They just couldn't quite end it out, and you have to hope that they're going to be able to do that, but it's not like the schedule gets easier. Whatever team you face in the 2-2 section, like, it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be a Weibo gaming. It could be a Billy Billy gaming. Like, you're not going to get this easy, no-brainer team. I guess you might. You might get someone like Team Liquid, you know, at the end of the day, but, like, there's no guarantee that it gets easier from here. We keep talking about how G2 is guaranteed to be top eight, but they've definitely put it, uh, they've made it a little close here with this loss, but for T1... I'm happy for them. Obviously, you know, Worlds is T1. We all expected them to level up uh, throughout the tournament and throughout the World Championship just in general. They always show up at Worlds, but, you know, overall, it is kind of funny how little it matters <laughs> domestic performances at this point when it comes to this roster and when it comes to this team. This might be the last hurrah for League's greatest combined five of all time, and at least they're making it worth it right now by making it to quarters. But then moving on to our second series of the day, and it is our first one and two series and our first elimination series of round number four. One of these teams will have their tournament lives ended here today, unfortunately, and there certainly is a pretty big favorite going into this series. It's a matchup between the number one seed from the LPL in Billy Billy Gaming and the number one seed from the PCS in PSG Talon. Obviously, if Billy Billy loses this, it's about as much of a disaster as you could possibly draw up, but there is precedent for PSG playing Billy Billy really, really tough, and we saw that at MSI when these two teams played a best of five against each other, and PSG took them to the absolute brink. Obviously, Billy Billy has gone through a lot since then. They have really solidified, I would say, over the course of the summer split. However, this tournament has not been good for them. They're sitting at one and two for a reason. I think a big reason for that is obviously their draft reads and meta. I think everybody's really talking about it, and I have to agree. Generally speaking, this has been kind of the poster child team for opting into those low damage re Jin drafts that just don't really work right now i think both of those champions are really valuable as secondary pieces but pairing them together and not drafting some sort of damage on the top side of the map is just a disaster you don't really have any ways to actually extend games in the mid game you don't have any ways to actually win any sort of fights and so it ends up being a really big problem and it's been a problem for a lot of teams but all, basically everybody has pivoted out of those drafts Billy Billy has refused to pivot out of those drafts I think generally speaking this team is very stuck in their ways they've kind of been like that for a while over the course of this year they've always kind of just played what they have wanted to play but I think they've more than any other team just completely ignored tournament results in the tournament meta so far and just played what they think is good and that's really hurt them that's become a, a major hindrance and and I guess we'll see what happens moving forward in this series, but kind of the big storyline going into this, obviously, with Billy Billy on the brink of elimination, they're making a change in their starting lineup. Wei is out, and Shun is back in. This is a very interesting decision. Of course, if you haven't been watching my channel or the LPL or anything like that, or really even international tournaments over the past little while, Shun has been Billy Billy's jungler for basically all of this year leading in to this tournament, except for the last, like, two weeks of the regular season and then the playoffs in the LPL, where way came in. He was acquired from RNG and became their starting jungler at the time. I very much criticize that decision because as I've said a couple of times on this channel, um, Shun is a really talented player and yes, he had some problems. He was the biggest issue for this team in MSI finals and sometimes his over aggression and his aggressive tendencies in general put this team in compromised positions, but I thought Shun gave them more upside. I thought Wei was definitely better for their floor and to me, that's not really what you need for a team that wants to try to win worlds. If you think you're good enough to win worlds without, you know, the exceptional jungle play of somebody, then I think, yeah, you 
you can bring in Wei. He's going to be super stable. He's going to allow players like Knight and Elk to look their best, and that's kind of what we saw. But generally speaking, I think Shun gives you more upside in terms of the performances he could potentially be putting out. And so it's really interesting that they're going to put him in here in a do-or-die game. It clearly shows that whatever they're seeing in scrims, they've talked about, you know, scrimming with both of these players throughout a majority of this tournament. Whatever they've seen has indicated that Shun is going to be better for them in this matchup and, and moving forward, presumably. So we'll see if that ends up mattering. I like this decision. I think it's generally fine. Not that I think it would be wrong to stick with Wei. I think they have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the talent that they have on their roster. Both of these are world-class junglers, world's caliber junglers. And so it's just whoever you think stylistically fits you better at any given moment. But for PSG on the other side of this, obviously they've not performed the way that they wanted to over the course of this tournament. I think people went into this with the expectation that this was going to be one of the better PCS teams ever since like the PCS region change. And or the LMS region change into PCS, and that's just not been the case. They were okay in plans, they were fine, but they lost to Mad Lions, and obviously they've, they've rebounded relatively okay so far in the actual main stage, being able to take down MDK and knock them out of the tournament, but they are gigantic underdogs in a matchup like this. You have some, you know, player familiarity, you have players like Jinjia who have obviously played against a lot of the people on Billy Billy, and somebody who is very aware that a substitute jungler can come in and make a pretty big impact, as he himself did on EDG in 2020. You have a player in Maple who obviously has played against Knight a ton, actually replaced Knight on Sooning back in the day, and so that's definitely an interesting matchup to watch. You have a player in Betty who is one of the few like players at this tournament who's actually played against Elk, and obviously it's a very different Elk. It was Zhao Meng back then on WE, but Betty has played against him before domestically. Like There are a lot of storylines connecting these two teams together, and you know I'm really interested to see where it goes for PSG because I think if they play their style, it could be interesting, but their slow style needs to come through. Like, they need to slow the game down. They need to be able to drag things out because I think that's really the only way they're going to win. If they try to skill check Billy Billy, I just don't think they're going to be able to do it. So it's going to be interesting no matter what. We'll go ahead and see what happens, though. Let's get into it. The uh, only way to know how the series ends up going is to go game by game, and that means starting with game number one. So the winner of game number one was... Billy Billy Gaming. They are going to take game number one. They're going to go up in this series one to nothing, and boy, really should they have not won this game. I mean, this should have been unlosable for PSG. I mean, truly, they were in such a great spot. They have such a strong comp. I would argue a better comp for the back half of this game, or at the very least, an easier to execute comp, and they were winning everything on the map in the early game. They were able to transition that well into the mid to late game. It felt like they were stifling a lot of BLG's attempts to get back into the game, despite that one red buff fight. And it really felt like they should have just closed everything out, and they're just not able to do it. It's so frustrating to watch if you're cheering for PSG, but for Billy Billy, this is such a necessary comeback. I still think that they're egoing harder than any other team at the tournament. I shouldn't say that because you have teams like Fnatic and Team Liquid that just don't really seem to have a very good grasp of the meta right now. But Billy Billy, I mean, what is happening? Like, it is truly frustrating to see them do the things, the make the decisions that they make. I mean, PSG, first of all, makes the bad decision, which is to trade Aurora for Yone or Yone for Aurora or whatever. Leave them both up on red side. I think it's a gigantic mistake. I've talked about that a lot at this tournament. I do not think the Aurora is balanced in that section. I, in, a, in a bad way, I think Aurora is so much weaker than the Yone. I think Yone is just too strong right now. Giving him over under any circumstance, I just don't think is worth it. He does too many things. He has too much control on the map. Yes, Aurora can get these picks and can create a lot of problems and she is incredibly strong, but Yone can do everything in side lanes. He can do, he can team fight, he can win lane, he can side lane, he can, you know, objective control because he has great, like, narrow <laughs> engage. Like, it's very, very difficult to deal with Yone because he just does a bit of everything and he's got the highest damage in the game, and so you can't really actually trade against him, especially as an Aurora in the early game where you're going to get punished really heavily, and so PSG, you know, giving both of those over, I already think is a major mistake, but Billy Billy drafts the Aurora, and all of a sudden I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm freaking out. I'm like, what is going on? PSG get uh, Yone on red side, and it just... Something that's going on. Like, Billy Billy just doesn't seem to be watching a lot of the games at this tournament. That's really the only takeaway I have from this is I don't think this team is actually watching any other games because this just doesn't feel like a particularly fair trade. We'll get into that later. They end up drafting a very comfortable comp for them. Shun has played a lot of Wukong. He played it basically all of last year. When you go back to 2023, it was his most played champion by far. Um, Jax was obviously Bin's historic champion. He's in the uh, Heavy's the Crown music video as Jax. You have Elk and On on this really easy to execute engage. The rest of it, I feel fine about but 
this trade. I don't think it's particularly good. And then for PSG, you round up this comp relatively well. I don't love Kennen on the top side, but clearly Aja is just most comfortable playing that. I think Betty has a lot of opportunities to outplay on the Ezreal, which he does throughout this game. Like, comp plays, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but... PSG ends up getting this gigantic lead because Aurora has no pressure in the early game. Jax is not really going to have a ton of pressure in the early game. And On completely runs it down, which we will get into. He just completely screws over his entire team, gives Betty basically a free pass into the mid game to completely terrorize the rest of the map. And now all of a sudden you're looking at Sejuani Yone, you're looking at Kennen in side lane, you're looking at Ezreal potentially pushing waves, and they have a really good team fight. This game should be over. They should be able to control objectives. They've already started stacking dragons. How, how do you lose this? Well, Billy Billy just outplays them in the 5v5. That really is just it. Bin is a monster. Elk is a monster. This was a 2v8. I want to make that abundantly clear. As much as Shun and Knight, they have okay score lines. They were not as relevant in this game. Knight had a couple of moments that looked really good, even though I don't think he played perfect. But Bin and Elk were phenomenal. Whoever you want to give player of the game to, very similar to what I said about game two, 4T1 is kind of up to you. I'm going to give it to Bin because he consequentially was able to save these fights in a lot of um, pivotal moments. Like the, if he were to die in a couple of these circumstances, the game is over. <laughs> like, they just insta-lose, but Elk was the damage. Elk was the follow-up, and his ultimates were perfect in this game. Whoever you want to give player of the game to, it has to go to one of Bin or Elk, but they continue to be the stars for this team. Elk was somebody who I came into this tournament praising so much. I said he was the best AD carry in the world, or at least in terms of performances, he had been the best AD carry in the world over the course of this year. This was the kind of game that proves that at least somewhat correct. Um, I will say, though, on is gonna get dead of the game. Like, winning side, I know I don't do this often, but, like, he tried his best to lose this game for this team. Constant bad engages, constantly being too far forward, not respecting the enemy's damage, and basically giving free gold over to the Ezreal, which could have been disastrous. I mean, Betty was tearing up Billy Billy in these fights. Even in the back half when BLG was winning, they were doing it in spite of the Ezreal playing well, instead of, you know, shutting down the Ezreal or anything like that. It just felt horrible from On, and quite frankly, he's been bad at this tournament. Like, really, really bad. It reminds me a lot of Crisp last year with Weibo actually performing well and Crisp really struggling. Like, Billy Billy, I think, is good enough outside of On to really succeed, but man, he has just been, like, not good at this tournament and he's got to get better. Um, Shun looked fine, I guess, in game number one. Didn't have the impact that maybe you would hope from this game breaker. I think Wei has been better at this tournament than what Shun was here in game one. Hopefully he can turn that around in game two. And like I said, Bin, Elk, exceptional. Knight was fine. Like, certainly no negatives. Aurora, if you do get her to the point in the late game where she can actually start to do things, is incredibly broken. Unstoppable. Is as strong as Yone. The problem is getting there. I think you should be able to punish her a lot more than what PSG actually did in this game. Unfortunately, that slow and steady style ends up really coming back to bite PSG because they're just not able to close it out. Um, Dead of the game could have gone to a couple of players. I considered Junjia. I even considered Maple because he just didn't have the game impact that I was really hoping for. But I think generally, if you had a more consistent top laner, this could have been something. Like, Aja wasn't bad individually as a player, but I think Kennen is just so weak right now that it's almost not worth picking. Like, it's almost worth picking anybody else, even with the engage. Uh, Kennen just did basically nothing. Betty was so strong, though, and he had such a good game. And Junjia was obviously very awesome in the early game. And so it just didn't feel right to give Dead of the Game to anybody on PSG because I think for the most part, they played better than Billy Billy did. So I guess we'll see what happens moving into game number two. If PSG can keep their wits about them and bounce back and play like they did in game one, perhaps they're actually able to close this out and win and bring us to a game three. For Billy Billy, though, they want to put this behind them. They want to start getting back on the right track and they just want to win game two. They don't want this series to be interesting. They want it to be a blowout. So are they going to be able to show that they are the better team in game two or is PSG going to show that BLG is not this unkillable team that just cannot be beaten? Well, the winner of game number two was Billy Billy Gaming. They are going to take game number two. They are going to take this series two to zero, and they will be moving on to the two and two stage, joining G2, joining FlyQuest, and... Uh, joining uh, Deepos Kia. Sorry, I blanked on that for a second. Um, but uh, Billy Billy getting the win, keeping their tournament hopes alive. It would have been a disaster if they didn't win this. Honestly, it probably would have been a disaster if they lost a game against PSG. They really should not even be being tested by this team. This should be an absolute stomp, an absolute blowout. And that's not what this was. Game number two was definitely more dominant than game number one, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't this all-encompassing game that just had no issues. They're still grouping up in the middle of the jungle going up against Zion 
by a Smolder and then getting hit by, you know, both ultimates, like four or five man ultimates coming in from Smolder and Zaya. And obviously that's pretty fantastic for PSG. And, you know, BLG still has trouble playing around some of their strong members, specifically Knight, who they just don't really seem to know how to put in a good position. And they're constantly asking him to split push on the Jace when they really should just be trying to fight around him. It's very strange. It's very weird. I don't know if that's a Knight call. I don't know if that's a BLG call. Like, I don't know who is making that decision, but whoever's making that decision needs to stop making it because, you know, Knight's not typically a player that's kind of known for doing that. Honestly, his criticism has been that he groups too much at times over the course of his career. So very strange. I don't really know where that's coming from, but I mean, come on, player of the game, player of the series, it's Gigabin in the top lane. I get that the scoreline looks pretty mediocre, but I mean, come on, did you watch the game? This was ridiculous from him. I mean, TP flank after TP flank, obviously the big one around the Baron fight where he's able to, you know, TP in, uh, hop over the wall, stun three people, flash on top of a carry, pick up, you know, three, four kills, completely solidify the game. But BLG already had kind of a lead from that point. When you're looking at how they were able to stay in, you know, gold range, I would say, of PSG, how, how they kept this, you know, gold lead growing, I would say, throughout the game. Ben took, I gotta say, like uh, six or seven towers on his own, just split pushing in his side lane. Um, BLG did a really good job of pulling attention away. They were losing 4v5s pretty consistently throughout a lot of this game, but it didn't really matter because Ben was just getting so strong. And then by the end of the game, you see that 3v1 in the mid lane where he takes every bit of damage from the Skarner, from the Smolder, from the Rakan, and it just doesn't matter. He tanks through all of it from half health. He's able to jump on the Smolder, get a kill, and then jump out. He literally wins a 1v3. It's it's genuinely insane how strong Bin was by the end of this game, but this is Bin. Like, this is what you talk about when you talk about him as the best top laner in the world. You talk about his mid to late game, you talk about his ability to play the map and his ability to get gold. You don't really talk about his laning phase. Not that his laning phase is bad, but... Like, this is what you expect of a player like Ben is to take over in these team fights and to always find the right the right flank angles. We saw a bit at the beginning of the tournament that sometimes he was a little bit over eager to find a flank and sometimes would be too separated from the rest of his team. That's where I think someone like Shillen actually could help out a lot for BLG over Wei. Um, they played fights a lot slower with Wei. I don't think it was like significantly slower and it definitely got faster in the playoffs, but they generally speaking were playing fights a bit slower with Wei and they're playing a lot faster with Shillen. And I think that that faster style actually helps Bin quite a bit, but it did kind of hurt BLG throughout the macro side of a lot of these games. And so it's really up to your personal interpretation, I think, of what's better. I think Wei is probably more consistent. You know, I, I wasn't super impressed by Shillen in terms of this performance. The Sedge has a really Really, really easy game here in terms of playing this out from the later half onwards. Shun was generally fine in it, but, um, you know, we'll see what happens when they're not playing a team in PSG. I imagine this was a bit of a trial run for Shun. We'll see if he passed, but... The other players that I really wanted to shout out, Knight, obviously, on the Jace gets this gigantic early lead, ends up building Hubris, and ends up really trying to stack. If he can't build Magi's, he's got to build Hubris. It's just kind of the Knight thing. The Jace is a really interesting pick. It's kind of funny that it's fallen out of the meta because I still think it's really good, especially pairing it up with something like a Sejuani. I think teams are really going to start picking more of that as we continue on with the tournament, so long as their mid laners are comfortable on the Jace. I think there are a couple of good Jace players at this tournament, so we'll see about that moving forward. And the big early game lead that Knight was able to get, obviously, is the Jace over the Smolder was uh, really important for establishing tempo for BLG. I thought On was exceptionally good in the first like five to ten minutes of this game and then like really not good throughout the rest of it. On again has been just super inconsistent for this team. It's very weird but uh, out of position just way too much in the mid game. Just doesn't really seem to have a good idea of where he needs to be with the rest of his team right now. Um, Elk was fine on the Kai'Sa. Maybe a little bit low damage but your AP Kai'Sa it's just it is what it is, right? Like, Ben was the star, and Knight was kind of the supporting cast in this game. Billy Billy's gonna be happy they were able to walk away with a win, but it wasn't this, like, decimating win that maybe you would have expected. PSG, on the other hand, they put up a really good fight, and they really did give it their all, but this is going to be the end of their Worlds 2024 run. You know, this might be the last game we ever see Maple play. In fact, I think it is the last game we will ever see Maple play on a professional stage, and it really sucks that I have to give him done of the game. That feels so, so bad. Like, you don't understand how... <laughs> not good. That feels to me, Maple, a true legend of League Esports, the single best player in LMS, PCS, history, whatever you want to call it. Like, you can talk about some of his teammates, but none have the resume and the longevity that Maple has as a career. And so, he's got the best career of any, you know, LMS, PCS player of all time. And unfortunately, that ends in this one. It's uh, It ends with him trying to 1v3 a Jax and <laughs> dying. It's really an unfortunate end. But at the end of the day, like, this team making it here is 
is really, really impressive. And then putting up a fight against BLG, almost winning game number one, super impressive stuff. They still were able to find some good angles here in game number two. They just never really had the answers to the important questions. They were able to pick up things here and there, but nothing, you know, super consequential. But hopefully, you know, we see Maple more in the future as like a coach or as an analyst or something like that, because this guy just needs to stay in the scene. He's obviously so knowledgeable and, and so committed to the game. So, um, you know, it sucks that this is the way it goes out. But I mean, you know, fighting Billy Billy Gaming, like it's pretty apropos. The number one team from the LPL. This is a pretty good way to end the career, I would say, for Maple. Um, the rest of this team was generally fine. I thought Jinjie had a really good game on the Skarner. It just didn't really matter. His tempo was pretty good. Skarner generally just can't really do much in the back half of these games. Betty goes for the ultimate Zaya pull uh, in one of these fights and just isn't able to actually kill Elk. It's actually tragic. Aja, Woody, they were generally fine. Aja had basically no impact on the fights outside of his ultimate, but the ultimate was effective and Woody tried his best, but the charms just didn't really matter by the end of the game. They had too much damage. And so overall for PSG, they gave it their best effort, but this is going to be the end for the last PCS team at the tournament. Not the last minor region team at the tournament, as I had to edit out of this recording, because obviously Gam is still alive playing Team Liquid tomorrow, but um, for PSG, they put up a great effort. I genuinely think this team was what we thought they were going to be going into Worlds, despite what their plans showed. I think they showed who we thought they were going to be in the main stage, and that's a really good sign. Hopefully, the PCS and, you know, the APAC region can continue to grow, and we can see them, you know, really develop going into next year. But for Billy Billy, they're going to feel super fortunate to be able to move on, and obviously, most of the opponents in the 2-2 uh, section don't want to draw Billy Billy. Like, there's nobody that's going to be nearly as scary as BLG at their best, and so, you know, we'll see what what happens, but this is still a team that's very favorited to make the quarterfinals. All right, but that is going to do it for my Worlds 2024 Swiss Stage Day Number 7 Overview and Analysis video up on the screen. Of course, all of the updated standings. Only two more series remain here in round number four to determine how the 2-2 two and two bracket is going to end up shaping out. Two more elimination series tomorrow as we finish off the 1-2 and two side. Of course, all of the 2-1 games are done. HLE, T1, Top Esports, they're moving on alongside Genji and LNG to the quarterfinals. The winner of the two series tomorrow, the two winners, they're going to be in the two and two stage to face off against either Deepless Kia, G2, FlyQuest, or Billy Billy after the results from the first four series. You guys know how it works. So let's quickly preview what I think is going to happen again. If you want a more detailed breakdown, go to day number five and watch the end of that video. I go through every single matchup of round number four. That includes the two that I'm going to talk about here. So I'll quickly just recap what I've said, but I do want to add something on to the end of it. You've got Team Liquid taking on Gam. This should be major. Majorly Team Liquid favored. Uh, they were able to kind of get over some of their demons in the Pain Gaming series, but there's still a lot going on with TL that is just a little bit scary. It seems they're very nervous right now. Umpty in particular just doesn't look very good. Not that that's surprising. I've always been a lot lower on Umpty on this channel, especially going back to his LCK days, but even someone like APA is really looking nervous right now. It's kind of been up to Yawn to carry a lot of these games. Impact has struggled internationally. Gam is not a pushover of a team. I do think that they are better than Pain, but I don't think this is some sort of matchup that, you know, Team Liquid could lose and not be free from crit, you know, be free from criticism of. Like, no, this is a must win for Team Liquid. If you lose to Gam, if you get eliminated in this tournament by Gam, like, that's on you because as good as Kiaya and Levy and, you know, even someone like Easy Love, as good as they are, like, Team Liquid is so much better basically every Everywhere else across the board. I do think top lane could be a bit of a scary matchup because Kiaya does take advantage a bit of mistakes and Impact's not exactly the most consistent laner in the world, but, you know, as long as Impact's able to get to those late game team fights where he really thrives, I think it's going to be fine. Team Liquid should be able to come out on top. And then the more interesting one for me, Weibo Gaming taking on Fnatic. I think this one is definitely interesting to watch because it's two of the more early game aggressive teams in the entire tournament. Weibo's just a better version of Fnatic, so I would expect this to not be particularly close in this sense that, you know, Fnatic really shouldn't have a ton going for them. If they don't win early, I don't think they have any chance of being able to win any games, but Weibo's not exactly been super clinical at this tournament. Their win over Team Liquid came in the back half of the game after TL basically handed it to them, and every other game that they've played have, has not looked particularly good. They already lost to G2, another European team, and so maybe Fnatic has something there. If Razork and Humanoid can play really well early on and generate some tempo, I think it's possible for them to win a game or two in a series like this and move on to 2-2, two and two, which would be a disaster for Weibo, but I think Tar 
Tarzan is probably the best player in this series, and that leads me to believe that Weibo is likely going to generate enough of an early game lead to be able to win these. But certainly something I'm going to monitor, I think Humanoid versus Xiaohu, two very inconsistent mid laners with very high highs. I think that's going to be a very interesting one to watch. But let me know if you agree or disagree with me down in the comments section below. Always love hearing your thoughts and opinions, but that's going to do it. I do hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit subscribe. I will let you guys know tomorrow's video hopefully will be out at a good time, depending on how long games go. I've, I've got some things to do in the afternoon, and so if it doesn't come out until a lot later at night, I do apologize. You know, I've been trying to get these out basically right as games end because I'm recording them after each game, and so... You know, I apologize if tomorrow's is going to be a little bit more delayed than they have been over the course of this tournament, but it still will be out on the same day, just maybe at night, um, unless it's like four games like it was today, and then maybe I'll be able to get it out um, right after the uh, the games are done. I don't know just yet. We'll see how things go, but um, definitely something I wanted to let you guys know about, and with the subscribe thing, if you're interested when those videos do go live, I know typically you can kind of expect them an hour or so after the games, but if you want to be notified when that video goes up tomorrow, hit subscribe, hit that bell so you can be notified. Of course, we are also posting throughout the the rest of the entire tournament. We're going to be doing off-season stuff, so it's all, all good. The subscribe button is definitely worth it, and we're getting closer and closer to 2,000 subscribers. It really would mean a lot if you hit that button, but with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day, and I will see you all later.